Welcome to the Pacey Performance Podcast. Today, I'm speaking with sports scientist and researcher, JB Marin. This episode of the Pace and Performance Podcast is sponsored by simplyfaster.com and that's spelled S-I-M-P-L-I faster.com. So alongside the free lap timing systems, simplyfaster.com currently holds the eccentric K-Box. So if you haven't heard of the K-Box, it's a new product that uses flywheel technology to allow higher velocity eccentric overload. So I saw the K-Box the first time when Mike Young from the US brought a couple over for one of his workshops in Gloucester. So off the back of that, I was really keen to use one and I actually got my hands on one and was able to spend a couple of hours playing around with lots of different exercises and getting used to the K-Box. So from personal experience, getting out of the bottom of the squat, powering up and having the K-Box pull you through the floor on the way down is absolutely incredible. So basically, the harder you go on the concentric portion of the lift, the more it's gonna give you on the eccentric. So if you're gonna go for it, you're gonna get pulled through the floor. At simplyfaster.com, there's also a great blog from Frederick, who is one of the co-owners of Eccentric, so you can learn more about the K-Box there. So if you are interested in getting a K-Box, get to simplyfaster.com, so that's S-I-M-P-L-I, faster.com, and get a K-Box for yourself. So today we've got a guest on that keeps coming up when I speak to people who, well, about who I should get on the podcast in JB Marin. So we were trying to get this sorted for ages and lack of Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi problems meant that it was delayed a little bit. So today we discuss what makes people fast. So practical ways to develop speed in, in athletes ranging from sprinters to field spot athletes. We also discuss horizontal force production and vertical force production and the, uh, the differences between them two and how we can develop both. So it's a great episode of JB. Uh, he goes into a lot of detail um, around, around all them subjects. So just before we get into the chat, I just want to remind you that on Sunday the 11th of October, it's the Pace Performance webinar series with Dan Baker. So if you are interested, jump over to paceyperformance.co.uk forward slash Dan Baker and you can you can log on then uh, and register there. If you are in a time zone that means that you'll be asleep at that point, don't worry because you can get all the recordings after the webinar. So just before we do get onto the chat with JB, if you want to follow me on Twitter at PaceyPerform and you can keep up to date with everything that's going on the podcast. If you want to listen to previous episodes of the podcast, we've got 51 now, go to paceperformance.co.uk forward slash podcast. Hope you enjoy the chat with JB and I'll speak to you soon. Hi guys, welcome to the Pace of Performance podcast. So I think it's about the fifth or sixth time I've tried to uh, do a podcast with JB Marin. So really excited to get JB on. Hopefully the recording and the internet hold up. So welcome to the podcast, JB. Hi, Rob. Thanks for inviting. No worries. So do you just want to give us a little bit of um, an introduction on your education, your background and what you're currently doing? Yeah, so my background is uh, sports science and sports performance. Uh, studies. Uh, I had my PhD in 2004. Then I um, worked for 10 years in Saint-Étienne in France as, a, as an assistant professor. And last year I moved to Nice in the south of France uh, to a full professor position. And I'm studying uh, uh, human locomotion biomechanics, sports performance and um, mainly running and sprinting mechanics. So is, is that position um, a lot of teaching involved? Or is it mostly research? Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, teaching as well. Uh, okay. I teach in masters. It's about uh, something like 200 years, uh, 200 hours a year. Yeah. Interesting. So I just want to, um, we might as well get straight into the, uh, the crux of the conversation. So what, what's, what kind of research are you currently doing? Anything interesting? 
Yeah, our, our current research is about, uh, we have two, two topics. Uh, one is about um, um, the determinants of sprint acceleration, and we are moving to uh, the muscular determinants. Um, and the other one is about uh, force velocity uh, profiling and um, how it changes with training and how it's specific to the exercise uh, you're looking to improve. Okay, so with regards to the, the force velocity profiling, we had um, Matt Jordan on um, maybe two episodes ago, and he, he spoke about um, using, the, using the counter movement jump. What, what kind of things are you looking at with regards to force velocity profiling? Well, the, what we are currently writing, and I think this is going to be a, a very important uh, paper, is that uh, the, the force velocity characteristics of an athlete are depending on the movement uh, you choose, and, and the higher the level, uh, the more specific uh, the force velocity profile. And we show that uh, we did a study in a, uh, a very large number of athletes, and we show that uh, the sprinting and the jumping force velocity characteristics are not related anymore uh, when the level gets high. Yet they are when the level is low. So it means that uh, there's a specificity in the adaptations and that you cannot understand sprinting force velocity power characteristics from jumping anymore past a certain level. Okay. So how would how would you know what what that level is where that level is? I would say that we 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 were lucky enough to test about five hundred athletes, and uh, they are ranging from recreational to uh, world class uh, rugby, uh, soccer, and athletes. So I would say that uh, I don't know it's it's something like um, a kind of transition towards national level would be a, a moment where. Uh, you have this disconnection between jumping and, and sprinting cap capability. So for, for the athletes that are below that level, where would you, what, what method would you use to, to assess that force velocity profile? Would you go with one or the other? <laughs> the thing is that I would still be specific uh, any time I can, but the, the only thing is that um, given the fact that it's very well correlated, I mean, you, you can use whatever method uh, you choose. Um, if you have a low level or young uh, people, uh, if you just want to know their, their uh, force velocity profile of the lower limbs, you can choose indifferently jumping or sprinting, given what you think is more secure, given what you think is, is more practical for you. But you have to know that after a certain level, the information is not valid anymore. So just taking it back, um a little bit what what what's the protocol that you'd use for this force velocity profiling just to make it simple so we have we published two two different simple methods one is for jumping so the, the idea is that uh, you need to draw the force velocity uh, relationship so you need um, maximum jumps with additional loads so typically it involves uh, five jumps with five additional loads ranging from zero that's body weight up to depending on the level, 80% uh, to 140% of body weight. And the other protocol is uh, for sprinting. And uh, as recently published by Samozino uh, and our team, uh, you can draw the entire force velocity power profile of an athlete with just one 30 meter sprint. The only thing is that you need to measure either the speed time relationship during this sprint or the distance time relationship. That leads me on nicely to a, a question that got emailed to me when I, I put it out that I was speaking to you. So if you don't mind, I'll just read that out. That's the, yeah. um, uh, what's the best way to perform an acceleration force velocity profile util utilizing a digital timing system with only one split timer? Would you perform multiple 40s with a multiple split or would it be yeah. better to perform multiple sprints, 5, 10, 20, 30, 40? No, I, I would perform multiple uh, sprints over the same distance so that there's no pacing involved. Um, yeah, it's always better to have either a radar gun or uh, many split times, but if you want to do this kind of repeated sprints protocol, this is what we did with the force plate. We had only a seven meter force plate, and in order to reconstruct the entire acceleration mechanics, we did several sprints. 
But if you do that, you have to beforehand secure the fact that um, your sprinter is uh, giving reproducible data. So before trying and reconstruct the force velocity profile with only one split um, at, at different distances, you have to make sure that the performance is highly reproducible because very slight changes, uh, errors in the 5, 10, 20 meter splits will give uh, very big changes in maximum force or power of your athlete. Uh, just to add a little uh, tag on to the end of that question, um, if you if it's better to do multiple forties, which is obviously say it is, um, would you use mean or best times? Yeah, uh, I think I would use best times because you're dealing with maximum performance, and um, I think if if the athlete is reproducible, uh, then you should use maximum time. Uh, there's been publications uh, that show that basically it doesn't change a lot. So I mean. Of course, is the athlete is reproducible. If you take the average of the max, I think it doesn't change a lot, but I would keep the max. Okay. So when, when we spoke off air, you, you mentioned a, an app that you've been uh, a little bit involved with that can, that can potentially do something like this. Do you just want yeah, to tell, so, tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so uh, many of, the, of, the, of your followers um, uh, know MyJump application for jumping. The idea is that you film uh, with a high sampling rate the, the jumping movement and you click on the, on the screen of the phone uh, for the takeoff and landing pictures. And so the, the phone uh, calculates the flight time and very accurately the, eight, the jumping eight. So the idea of uh, a Spanish colleague named Pedro Jimenez, uh, who is working with us, is to do exactly the same but with sprinting. So the idea is that you film an entire acceleration uh, on the side and because the, the iPhone is uh, 240 frames per second you can have um, you can correct for the parallax issues and you can have some gates on the track correctly set and when the athlete crosses each gate you just click on the screen and it gives you the speed time so um, I've heard from this colleague that uh, the development was uh, quite uh, complete and I hope uh, that uh, this app will be, will be released uh, soon and it will be accurate. I hope that. So they have to do the, the validation protocol as well. So what kind of length of acceleration are we talking about? So the idea is that uh, you, need, you need directly to reach top speed. So depending on the level, depending on the age, uh, it, it may take between, let's say, 25 and 50 meters. But usually we use a standard 30 or 40 meters acceleration. Because at, at 40 meters, even a top level athlete has reached 96, 97% of his top speed. So that's enough to, to do the computations. So as, as you're filming, you're going to have to be quite far back to actually get the whole 40 meters yeah, within, so within, the, within the camera. Absolutely. So um, I guess um, with um, 20 meters. Uh, distance so you, it's 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 a t you're 20 meter away from the 20 meter mark and when you film with the iphone 6 the the, the sprint then you have the entire sprint and um well then we do the validation protocol so we will all can, um, see if, if it's valid or not okay cool so just to get into um a couple more questions so on a, on a very broad sense, what, what makes a sprinter a sprinter and, and how does that differ from uh, field team sport athletes? Yeah, that's a tough question because the, most of the times uh, the problem of transfer between the literature results and the practitioners and the field is uh, what is a sprinter and what do, we, what do we call sprinting? So if you talk about a track and field sprinter, a 100 meter runner, it's definitely someone who can accelerate a lot, reach a very high top speed as late as possible, because after that it's maintain and decrease in the speed. So I guess this is what makes a very good sprinter. It's a huge acceleration, a long distance to reach top speed, and then as much as possible. Uh, a limit in the decrease in top speed. No one keeps 100% of top speed until the line. 
So that's, that's a very important point. So it takes a, a huge horizontal force and power production at the beginning. This is what we tended to prove uh, with our uh, studies. And then once top speed is reached, it takes a high amount of vertical force within a short contact time. So this is what we observed and this is what people in the US observed in, in, in back in the 2000s and 2010. This is the work of Wayant and co-workers. And this is where the difference is with team sports, because in team sports, this top speed and beyond phase doesn't exist. And it's, it's almost never the case that uh, people in team sports reached top speed. Um, maybe in young soccer players, they reach top speed over very short distances. But if you take typical soccer or rugby players, it's only a matter of acceleration, forward uh, force production, and very short distances. Because I always discuss that with rugby coaches and, and SNC coaches. It's like, it doesn't matter if a rugby player is able to reach a top speed if he's tackled or if he's stopped by an opponent within the first 10 meters, because top speed will not exist. It will be tackled down. So the idea is uh, very high acceleration within very short distances. So how, what have you seen the differences with the, the kind of the technique of, say, a football player who at times we're running with the ball at his feet? How does technique, running technique differ and the, um, the kind of technical aspects of that, of that technique? I would say that uh, soccer is very interesting because um, it, it's a sport in which you need to accelerate with a body, an overall body posture that is overall uh, vertical. You cannot take uh, a three-point start, you cannot crouch, uh, you cannot start from the, from the pitch as some rugby players do when they catch the ball and run. So it's very interesting to see that uh, soccer players need to accelerate but they are constrained by this position. So they need to accelerate from a standing position. And this is from a technical point of view. I think, I hope our studies will, will show that um, you need um, a very intense hip extension actions. Because functionally, there's no other way uh, to accelerate forward with the human body in a vertical position. You have to kick the ground backward. I like to use the skateboard or uh, the, the scooter, the child scooter um, analogy. If you want to accelerate these things, uh, you have to push violently back. So this is the, a bit the difference. But this is only my point of view. We have no data uh, to, to, to differentiate sprint acceleration in soccer context or in other contexts. So that's, re that's really interesting. So how would, how would the training kind of fit in with that with that theory is, is traditional kind of um, sprint technique work applicable to someone that needs to be a lot more vertical when they're accelerating yeah I think that some of the training is is, is valuable because uh, you need a certain amount of strength you need a certain amount of, of uh, strength in the ankle uh, stabilizers muscles because in the end the force that you produce is transmitted uh, onto the ground at your feet. But um, I think that all the sprint technique that is related to the top speed phase and, and how to maintain and how to push the ground vertically, et cetera, et cetera, is, is not specific to, to an acceleration uh, from zero to, um, let's say, eight meters per second, or from five to eight meters per second, as you can see in soccer. So I think some things are similar and some things are totally specific. So when, when you look at um, kind of traditional uh, gym-based work to, to work on that, um, that acceleration phase, for, for, for a team sport athlete, what would that involve from your experience? Yeah, I think that um, uh, a basic level of strength is necessary and a basic level of, of explosive strength, most of all, because I don't want people to, to push. If you take the squats exercise, I don't. I prefer athletes who are able to push, let's say, 50% of their maximum, but at a very high speed, than people able to increase their uh, one RM in, uh, at the squat because um, I think it's much less specific. You you always have to think 
what is the velocity at which my force is produced. Because I'm not aware of many, many studies showing that there's a transfer between high strength, low velocity movements to high velocity, low strength movements. So you, you always have to think, okay, am I velocity specific in what I'm doing? And the other point is, um, if you want to increase this horizontal force production, uh, I think you need to focus on the muscles that functionally allow you to produce horizontal force when you're standing. And uh, these muscles are mainly the hip extensors and uh, the gluteus, the glutei muscles and the hamstrings. So I think that a uh, lot of work should be done on, on, in that direction. So you mentioned in a, in a, in a previous article um, that you, how, how much you value um, the, the work on the ankle. Yeah. Do you just want to give us a little bit of more in depth on, on why you think that and how you may go about training yeah. that? So that's my past of, uh, I, 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 was a, I was an athlete when I was young and uh, I coached a, a bit on sprinting and others. And the idea is that uh, if, you have a, if you have a high power production at the hip and at the knee, and if your ankle is weak overall, uh, it's, it's useless. Because if your ankle is weak, it will not transfer the force correctly. I, I always take the, the analogy of uh, hitting a, a door, like slapping a door with your hand. If your forearm muscles are weak, it doesn't matter if you have a violent action at the shoulder because your hand will not transmit the force. So I think uh, a lot of time should be spent on the foot quality and on the fact that the foot is transmitting without absorbing energy. And I think um, if I were an SNC coach, I would spend less time on developing the power and more time on developing how it is transmitted onto the ground. Um, when I was a basketball player, I often saw uh, very powerful players, but they had so weak ankles that change of directions, rebound jumps, etc., etc., was not so uh, brilliant. So, so how, would you, how would you go about specifically to train that quality? So uh, you have many, many drills uh, to, to work on the, on the strength of the ankle and its, um, its ability not to deform. So the idea is uh, skipping, jumping. And one point that is very important is that these muscles, the, the ankle stabilizers, they are uh, used to work and to fatigue because they are uh, balanced muscles. When you walk, when you stand every day, they work. So they are used to, you can burn them. You, you, you have to do long series until they burn down because they recover fast. And because if you do small series, uh, you will never uh, work uh, on these muscles. One very good point is uh, go and see a physiotherapist and check what, what kind of exercise is doing to, to uh, an ankle, uh, for an ankle rehabilitation protocol. And you just take these exercises because his aim in to get the ankle is to get the ankle stronger. So you want to do that in the training. Uh, so, uh, but one very important point is don't hesitate to burn these muscles down because they will recover fast and it's the only way to work and to improve them. Oh, uh, yeah, Rob, sorry, sorry. One, very, one very important point. On a team, different players, different ankle stabilizers abilities don't do the same number of series for every player. Do whatever it takes for each player to be very tired and to work on the muscles. Because if you say, okay, let's do 50 reps of this ankle stabilizing bozu ball exercise, some, some guys will be cooked much before that, and some guys will need twice that dose. So you have to be player specific on that. So, so how, how can we, uh, as S&C coaches, assess where each player fits on that kind of scale? Uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Uh, you can observe the quality of the foot when, when in changes of direction, in skipping exercises. You can, it's, uh, it's, you can quantify it, uh, not with numbers, of course, but you can see that. And you can have some tests like um, agility drills, in fatigue conditions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, uh, you can have one foot stance and 
uh, time, how much time it takes to, to fall down, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's not a very, um, it's not like kilos uh, on the on the bar uh, at the squat. Uh, it's more, yes, it's more qualitative. I understand. So again, we we spoke off air about a. Um, Something that was that was put on Twitter by uh, Martin Boucher, I think maybe yesterday or the day before, and, and a study that you'd been collaborating on with him. The title kind of fit in nicely with um, a discussion I had with Ben Peterson with regards to GPS yeah. um, and some kind of uh, progressions in in hardware. So it was just it was assessing stride variables and vertical stiffness with GPS embedded accelerometers. So you just want to give a bit of an insight onto what you looked at and what you found. Uh, yes, the idea here was with Martin to um, to use uh, GPS accelerometers, uh, such as um, many soccer and rugby team use. Maybe you saw the picture of Messi in a, in a recent game uh, wearing uh, such a device. Yeah. And the idea was okay when you when you run, uh, your center of mass or let's say the middle of your your back uh, could could show your stride asymmetries and your stride variabilities, provided you measure it correctly. So usually you measure it with force plates or instrumented treadmills. So we wanted with Martin to, to, to see if you can have the same qualitative information uh, with a very easy and wearable device. So what we did is that uh, they have an instrumented treadmill in, in uh, Spyro, so that was the time where uh, Martin was still working there. And so he put the accelerometer and he, he tried to run with different patterns. Uh, the normal pattern, different speed, etc., etc. And what, what he did is that he strapped very tightly one of his ankles. So he had a, an imbalance, a generated imbalance. And uh, just to see if the GPS in the, acceler the, the accelerometer, uh, not the GPS, the accelerometer was able to detect the imbalance that we generated. And it was the case. So uh, the idea of the paper, it's, it's a pilot study that just wants to show, okay, if you have a, a, an accelerometer embedded into the GPS, you can track imbalances, asymmetries in the, in the running pattern. The only, for me, the only use of that is long-term monitoring. Because if you, if you put this on an athlete and if you see a slight asymmetry, it doesn't give you a, a good information. It just gives you a picture of what he is now. Maybe he's, he's really uh, safe with that and he will never get an injury. But what's important is that if this changes over time between your different evaluations, then you have an information. So this, this was the idea of the paper is to say, okay, we can track very easily uh, some things that could be related to uh, fitness and injury. So this would take the place of um, a force plate in regards to measuring some variables? Yeah, that, that's very important. My answer is, of course, no, because you never replace the gold standard. The idea is there's so many variables uh, in a force plate, but what we need to know is, um, is the overall pattern changing or not? So we have less quality data, of course, but we have uh, high quality information. So, of course, uh, if you run a, a, a team sport uh, or whatever SNC program, uh, you would prefer that to a force plate. And our philosophy is always that, and, and I think Martin is sharing this philosophy as well, is, okay, what can we measure in absolute terms in the lab or in research, and what is useful to measure and possible to measure in our SNC context. That's obviously one device that is kind of under the wearables kind of category. How, how popular are wearables going to be and how is that going to take sports science, kind of take on in, in the sports science field? Yeah, I think they are already um, very popular. The two, I think the two issues are very simple. First issue, is it reliable? Is it valid? Because it's not because it's on the market and it's not because it's advertised that scientifically, rigorously, you show that it's valid. So SNC coaches should, should ask themselves, and this is what Martin do in, in Paris. 
okay, can I use that? Is it valid? Is the information, is it published, etc., etc. The second issue is, uh, is the information that is delivered useful to me in my own practice? Because if I have a ton of data and I never use those data or I use them in a sense that, uh, that I don't uh, uh, know correctly, then it's useless. So I think the good thing is valid data and useful data. Cool. So I'm just thinking then, um, watch the, the 100 meter final at the weekend. Yeah. Obviously, um, do you continue to work with Christoph Lemaitre? Yeah, we, we're, still part, we're still part of the monitoring of this, um, of the, of this printer. Uh, Pierre Samozino, my colleague, um, does it on a, on a regular basis because he's, he's uh, only one hour away from, from their training uh, uh, facilities. And we're still uh, trying to, to put, um, to confront the training programs, uh, the performance and the force velocity power output of the sprinter. And it's always a discussion between the coach and, uh, and ourselves. And, but we're still following him. And over the years, since our 2011 uh, and 12 studies, uh, many things have changed in this guy. And uh, the idea is um, when you change your level of strength, when you change your, your body, your body mass, uh, for some people it takes time to, to drive it again uh, at, a, at, a, at a fast speed. When, when I talk with my students and they say, okay, why isn't he improving anymore? And I say, okay, if you used to drive um, a slow car and I'm giving you a 400 uh, horsepower car, on the, same, uh, on the same track, you will not do the best uh, time uh, before maybe months or years. So I think is is right now in this adaptation period. So did it make the semi-final, is that right? Yeah. Okay. So what, what kind of things are you expect in the future for Lemaitre and the things that you've been working on with him? Obviously not saying, saying too much, but... No, but uh, I think it's... I think it's um, when we tested him, it was, this is very uh, historical. When we tested him, his, his strength background was almost zero. We, had, we were lucky enough to test a guy who was below 10 seconds with almost no history of heavy strength training. This never happens because when you have a sub-10 guy, you always have someone who is uh, um, already very high in the strength training uh, history. So things changed and now the idea is, I think in the future, uh, the idea is now he needs to turn the level of strength that has increased, definitely, numbers show that, into running speed. And this is exactly the debate that we have and, and, and the things that we try to show is, okay, how do we transfer this, let's say, gym strength into uh, running speed? What we observed in Lemaitre was that um, he had a really high velocity capability. He was not strong, but uh, we tested him, we never published this data, but we tested him on a cycle sprint. He was able to turn the legs, he's 1 meter 93, okay? He was able to turn the legs at more than 200 rotations per minute. This is very fast. But uh, his maximum power was not that high. So the idea is that he was really a, a velocity machine. So, uh, and, and this level of velocity has not been met anymore by him uh, over the last four years. So the idea is, is here, okay. You increased your level of strength. Now you will need to transfer that to speed, to running speed. So maybe, maybe, uh, sorry, it, maybe it will be a very good example of the fact that this transfer is really a big issue, a big issue, because uh, he never ran faster than when he had no strength. You get that? Yeah. <laughs> that, that's okay. It's, you can say it's a freak. You can say it's an exception. It's it's an outlier, but the things are here. He never ran as fast as when he had no strength. To say to say it simply. <laughs> how is that viewed on his on his part? Is is he how how is he feeling about that? that I don't know because um, I don't know because the competition in France uh, was um, there was only him back in the years, but now there's another guy, Jimmy Vico, 
who stole the French record. And um, there's like a, a competition, and I think that uh, I don't know. I, I'm not in in his mind, but I think the 200 meter is is uh, is is his distance, not the hundred. But uh, I think to perform same thing on the 200, his record is 1980. He never did that again in the in the last four years. So the idea is that now he will on the 200. You need to accelerate, but you also need top speed and to maintain top speed. So uh, I think now the challenge is is here uh, within the next two or three years, get that speed back to a higher level because of this new level of strength. This is very this is fascinating. Excellent. Just to round up a little bit. So you we went through your current research at the um, at the start. What what's what does the future hold? Uh, for now, uh, no. We in the last years we put I think we put two things that are important on on the on the market. Let's say first we gave some methods that are reliable to accurately monitor force, velocity, and power in jumping and sprinting. And second, I think we changed a bit the view of sprint acceleration uh, with new insights into the importance of horizontal force production. On this basis, the coming works, and I hope people will collaborate uh, with us on that, the coming works will be two directions. The importance of training and uh, the use of the simple methods will, will, will be helpful. And what training improves best this horizontal force production, et cetera, et cetera. So I think these are the two directions. Now, we, we did only cross-sectional approaches. Now we need long-term and we need training studies. Excellent. Cool. So, so where can people keep up to date with your work? Well, I think the best way is uh, Twitter because um, I try to centralize on Twitter uh, the information and the publications. And of course, uh, we try to get uh, paper available to people on, on websites like ResearchGate or by direct email. So uh, these are the two ways to, to get in touch with us. But make sure you read the whole article, not just the title. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Please. <laughs> because sometimes, sometimes you want to, when you read the paper, you really want to rewrite the title. Because and as a, when I review papers, it's always something that I, I focus on. Don't lie. Well, it's not lying. It's telling too much. Don't overinterpret your conclusions. It's frustrating. I know that. But uh, it's misleading for the readers, especially with Twitter now. Yeah. So why, why wouldn't you do the title afterwards rather than so, before? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Maybe you, you, you write the title after the results section. And you say, okay, this is what. And there's a difference between what you want to title and what you have to title. Yeah. But, yeah. Now, this is very important for students and for SNC coaches, because if you only take the title as a conclusion, for, for example, the, the main question when I read a paper is, what was the population? Who were the subjects? Because if the conclusion is on, let's say, low level uh, basketball players, and I'm coaching top level volleyball players, the conclusions are not uh, useful to me, or maybe partly not useful to me so very important thing what was the population so what's your twitter handle jb and that's jb mori cool is it is yeah. it has it got an underscore in there or is it not yeah that's uh maybe yes jb underscore mori cool well i'll put that on the website so people can uh get in touch with you yeah great so finally we got it done internet was fine and i will just thank you for your time and i'll, yeah. I'll, let, you, I'll let you get back to work Okay, thank you, Rob. Okay, mate. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to episode 52 of the Pacey Performance Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the chat with JB. Just finally, big thanks to simplyfaster.com for sponsoring the episode today. So if you are interested in getting a K-Box or interested in learning more about the K-Box, get to simplyfaster.com. So that's S-I-M-P-L-I faster.com. Just before I let you go, don't forget that is the Pacey Performance Webinar Series number one with Dan Baker on Sunday the 11th of October at 10 a.m. British Summer Time. So get to paceyperformance.co.uk forward slash Dan Baker 
and you can sign up there. Thanks for tuning in and I will speak to you in episode 53.